Hey, y'all, and welcome back to Hawk Off the Press. I'm Leah Van. I am your Hawkeye football beat writer for the Gazette. Today, I am joined by John Steffi. And yeah, so um, the reason John is joining us today is we do have a little bit of breaking news. John will actually be taking over as the Hawkeye football beat writer after this week, this Saturday will actually be my last day covering Hawkeye football. Um, so this has been kind of a whirlwind of a two of past two weeks. I actually got a new job covering LSU football for the advocate down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So you could say that I'm pulling a Texas and moving to the sec. My cat is talking to me. Um, this was not an easy decision. Obviously Hawkeye nation is very close to me. I have a lot of dear friends in Iowa and this, this being my second time I moved here, I did not anticipate leaving as quickly as I am, but sometimes opportunities present themselves at non opportune times. And as someone who has lived far from home for the past four years, since I've graduated college, I decided personally that this is in my best interest to go ahead and move to Louisiana. I'm four hours away by a car from my little brother and I've missed a lot of his, uh, a lot of major things in his life. And so I'm excited to be back closer to home. I'm excited to cover sec football, which has been a huge dream of mine, of course. Um, but I, I've appreciated all of the readership I've had here. I appreciate the time that I've spent with the coaches and the players. Um, y'all have truly touched my heart and it's going to be really tough to leave. It's going to be really tough to leave, but I wanted to let y'all know that I've loved every minute. I wish I could have spent longer, but this is just my sayonara. And on a uh, higher note, John Steffi has been our business reporter slash sports enterprise reporter these past couple of months. He has a sports background, um, mainly rooted in Wisconsin. He's a Marquette alum. And uh, I know he's thrilled to take over this beat. Sports are his first love. Business is definitely not. I think I can say that on the record. <laughs> so, John, why don't you Probably tell? A safe thing to say. Yeah, why don't you tell our readers uh, your sports background so they can kind of get to know you? Yeah. So you mentioned having the sports enterprise background. That was kind of the fun way of me still being able to channel my first love while working on my second love of business. Um, But I am familiar with sports both from other places and at the Gazette. In 2019, I was a news and sports intern. So um, I did a fair amount of Hawkeye stuff then. Um, Then I, senior year of college at Marquette, was a freelancer for the Gazette, helping out with Hawkeye coverage. So two of my first three road games are going to be places where I've already covered Hawkeye football for the Gazette. So it definitely has that familiarity um, in terms of Wisconsin and Northwestern. Um, Also at Marquette, I covered basketball there. So um, college basketball is something that while not the big part of this beat is something that I also know kind of in the back of my head, I've covered postseason basketball, um, covered games, kind of, you name it, uh, Madison square garden, March madness, all of that. So while I don't have a ton of background covering Iowa games, aside from a little bit of freelancing, um, sports is certainly something that isn't new to me. It's something I'm incredibly excited to get back to. Um, I really, it's bittersweet because there were a lot of great aspects of the business beat, but sports is a lot of fun and I'm ready to have a lot of fun with you all. Um, I want to get to know our Hawkeye subscribers really well. Um, If you see me at Trader Joe's, um, getting my groceries or getting my coffee from any number of the like eight coffee places you can go to in Iowa City that's not called Starbucks. Um, please feel free to introduce yourself. Um, I'm excited for this. Um, this isn't possible without our readers. And well, 
in podcast form our listeners. So um, I am very excited for this new journey. It was fun spending today around Kinnick and the Hanson practice facility um, with media availabilities today and looking forward to telling a lot of excellent stories. Um, as Leah mentioned, I am born and bred Midwest. So grew up watching the Big Ten. Um, was, did not go to Wisconsin. Not a Wisconsin that. fan. <laughs> He's a Marquette fan, which yes, their football so, team is non-existent. So they're also undefeated. Yes. yes, they are undefeated since 1960, which I definitely have not brought up to anybody, any of my friends who have struggling college football teams. And I certainly wouldn't have said that to Leah before, but yeah, so true Midwesterner, um, love my cheese curds and my frozen custard. Um, he already fits in of- better than I do. And uh, <laughs> we did do the food reviews in the newsletter this summer. Just so everybody knows, the newsletter will continue under John. Uh, I will be writing the last one th- uh, under my name this week. Um, so you can read that. And then, um, yeah, he will be continuing this podcast. I think he will be keeping a lot of the same format, but also adding his own flavor to it because it is John's beat now, but yeah, he is a Wisconsin boy, but not a Wisconsin fan. (laughs) Yes. So that is a big distinction. There is funny when I first moved here, not as intern John, but as full-time reporter, John, people are asking, Oh, where are you from? That kind of thing. I'd say, oh, I'm from Wisconsin, from the Milwaukee suburbs. And like, oh, Badgers said, oh, no, no, went to Marquette. Don't worry. So that's one thing that, um, yeah, I've already had questions about when I started on the business beat. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited. Well, John, I'm really excited for you. Of course, you being one of my close friends here at the Gazette, uh, I know how much you wanted this and. Uh, yeah, just over the moon. But, you know, since we are still together here, you know, sharing the beat this week, we're sharing the beat through Wednesday of next week. Uh, let's talk some Hawkeye football. Yes, let's do that. Yeah. And Enough I wanted of this to know- kind of big career news where, I mean, you're talking about moving and I'm thinking, oh, man, Leah's moving. But here's this great thing for me. Yeah, let's get back to football here yeah let's get to like sunshine and rainbows and uh Spencer yeah. Petrus passing the ball more than <laughs> 15 yards yeah okay so uh <laughs> by the way John will be getting this fancy microphone when I leave so he will have the better audio um that will be the most exciting part of this whole thing and that's clearly like a nice so having the podcast color. microphone and if y'all remember we did do a podcast together on nil or earlier this summer in the alston case and so he's very knowledgeable about you know a lot of that side of sports too and especially with the business mind i think it's going to be really exciting here um with all the nil deals that a lot of the players are starting to get into um you know on the horizon. But my first thing is I know that you've done some scouting on Colorado state. So I was wondering if you could give us a breakdown of what these Rams are going to bring, including this like very notable tight end. Yeah. I don't think you can get very far in talking about the Rams without looking at tight end. And this probably isn't something totally foreign to Hawkeye fans, considering just how many great tight ends that have gone through I mean, Kinnick over the years, but this is a guy who you really have to think about where Colorado state upset Toledo, a pretty good Toledo team as non power five programs go where the week before Toledo was hanging right in there with Notre Dame didn't end up winning, but it was a competitive game. So they upset Toledo and almost all of their passing offense went to one guy, I mean, which is incredible. And really you have to circle Trey McBride as the, as you're looking through this game, that's the name you got to circle in terms of who could make a big impact for Colorado state. So he's a guy that coach Ferentz brought up right away. Um, as he was talking about Colorado state, 
And I said, well, does it help that you've had, you know, a lot of good tight ends and you have that good history and track record of tight ends as you're going up against that? And he said, well, nobody on our scout team plays like Trey McBride. Yep. So this is going to be a really interesting matchup here where they really aren't a great passing attack in general, but Trey McBride is the exception there where I think is 109 of the 111 or maybe is 110 of the 111 passing yards that Colorado state had against Toledo went to McBride. So he was literally the entire passing game went through him. Pretty. I much. think for reference uh, Toledo, um, I just pulled up the score from the Notre Dame game. Uh, Notre Dame barely beat Toledo, like 32 to 29 is the score of that game. And so then Colorado state goes in. And that was at Notre Dame too. Yeah. Colorado state goes and kicks their butt 22 to six. I think at they, I think they're Toledo. at Toledo. And I think they, as I read today in like, I think it was the Fort Collins, Colorado shout out to local news. Um, they narrowed that running game to like 1.9 yards per carry. Um, so at least for one of the running backs. I don't know if they ended up putting in another one. I didn't end up reading the rest of it, but yeah. Um, so they do have a good strong front, which I know we hear that a lot. And we'll heard that a lot from players today on Iowa's side too. Um, but also what's interesting is they do play a different de- defensive concept than what we've seen the past two weeks. Right. Yeah. Well, we've seen a lot of the three, three fives. Um, and I'm a big fan of the three, three, five myself. I think as we see more and more kind of spread schemes in college football, that makes a lot of sense, but this is much more of a four, three team that's, uh, be willing to put a lot of pressure where we've seen some of these teams where they just haven't been super aggressive blitzers that, you know, with that three, three, five scheme, you only have six in the box oftentimes this is a team that will put a little more pressure up front and it'll be an interesting test here for kind of a younger offensive line than that still is very good but maybe not quite up to past Iowa offensive lines so that'll be an interesting test as well yeah certainly and yeah is it the question is, is it going to be up to Iowa standards that the Iowa offensive line but certainly having these two games as a tune-up is awesome. And you're getting some true freshmen and like Connor Colby. And I know that Kirk Ferentz was talking about, you know, the importance of having multiple guys who can rotate in and, you know, having that versatility, especially with Kyler shot, just kind of making his way back into the lineup gradually. Right. He's got to get in shape. So, yeah. You know, those he bailing accidents are, they really are devastating. Uh, yeah, I will be coming out with a story on that. Uh, but Kyler was really funny today. He's like, yes, I have bailed hay like many times. Yes. I have jumped off of hail, like, a uh, hay bales, like many times. And this has never happened until this time. So, um, <laughs> it was kind of funny. I know he was sick of talking about it, but you know, we had to ask, we're asking. Yeah. Some and he was a good sport about it. I thought he was, he was, uh, um, and one other thing about Colorado state that, this is totally the nerd in me, but their punter is incredible yes. and has been one of the best punters statistically this season. There's been a lot of talk about how great Tory Taylor has been, and he has been great, but the Colorado state punter is even better. And he had like an 81 or an 82 yard punt against Vanderbilt earlier this year. Jeez. And yes, some of that's coming off a of bounce. You're not going to get all of that on air, but I'd say, I mean, rough math here, maybe 70 ish was in the air. So that's another thing where there's been a lot of talk about how have I was done well in terms of field position with Tory Taylor being such a great punter. Well, now maybe they get a little bit of a taste of their own medicine, but the issue is I don't think that the rest of Colorado state is going to be that much of a threat. So might be seeing a lot of punting from the Rams. That might be their only angle, uh, that and their <laughs> tight end. We'll see though. We'll see. Uh, yeah. um, yeah, but I know a lot of people have been questioning about the offense, like our mailbag question. We had one mailbag question so far. I have not gone back on Twitter since logging on to zoom, um, asking if 
Spencer will throw the ball more than 15 yards. You know, we saw a lot of those little bubble screen passes. We saw, uh, you know, a lot of those little pitches to the outside that aren't even passes, you know, they're just kind of like, they are running plays. Um, but, um, you know, the thing about Petrus is this is the, exactly what Brian Ferentz said he designed the offense to do. He said, if you want his completion percentage to be better, he's going to throw short, shorter passes, low risk passes. He's not going to turn the ball over, which is incredibly important. And especially when you're playing, you know, you're opening up with Indiana, you're opening up with Iowa state. Now I feel like he's got some leeway to throw some, like, I don't know, get, get jiggy with it, you know, <laughs> like get fun. And I asked Petrus today, I asked him, I was like, do you have aspirations to throw the ball deeper? which he did. He threw a 48 yard pass to Nico Reganey in last game and an 18 yard pass to Sam Laporta. Um, he was like, yeah, I mean, obviously. And he said something about how, you know, if you are able to execute those bigger plays, it does give you a 60, a 60% 60 chance, um, of winning or like a better chance of winning, um, or, you know, sealing out the game at that point, I'll have to go back and reread the quote, but yeah, um, he's very into analytics. Um, he always, brings up a percentage. I don't know what his deal is. Um, but Petrus, <laughs> some notable things that came up in our notes is that he's gone nine, you know, nine consecutive wins under Iowa quarterback, Spencer Petrus, 25 for 36 for 209 yards passing the last game. That's a 69% completion percentage. Um, 25 completed passes. It's just short of his career high. Um, and through those last, let's see, nine games, 10, touchdown passes, two interceptions, um, but no interceptions in the past five straight games for him. Uh, as far as the running game, uh, Tyler Goodson was the first running back since Akram Wadley to have three touchdowns in a game since 2017 against Nebraska. And yeah, we've got some defensive statistics that I could bring up later, but um, John, it I want to ask. Like we've gotten more questions though. As oh, I yeah. open up Twitter. Let's so, fire him away. Fire him. Well, one that got thrown, I'm assuming it's in my direction. Yes. Um, was how many parties did you go with with D Wade? So <laughs> yeah. That one, D Wade is a little older than me. Yeah. And by a little, like almost 20 years. So <laughs> Unfortunately, no parties with him. Um, although, you know, Milwaukee, I mean, Wisconsin in general is kind of a drinking state. But yeah, no, I had interviewed him. Um, he's a good quote, but no parties with him. Um, and then back to football, um, got a question. Were there any concerns slash pain points that the coaching staff mentioned from last week's game? If Jacobs doesn't force that fumble, you're looking at a one score lead over a Mac team in the second half. And that's a great point there. That is a great point. Um, I did not, I mean, I have not sensed any concern from any of the coaches or players so far, other than the fact that they wanted, um, they keep saying, you know, we got to keep working on our offensive line, our defensive line. What, what did you assess from today? Yeah, I mean, it didn't come across as a coaching staff that was concerned. And um, because that, frankly, is a good point that it could have been a lot different than it was. It's kind of the 30 to 7 game that didn't feel like a 30 to 7 game. It really um, didn't. Like it felt a lot closer where it's like, wait a second, that really is the final score. It's a 23 point game. I really didn't think they were going to cover there when they were, when Kent state was driving down to the one, but yeah, no, it seems like I wasn't too concerned about that. Um, granted Kent state is probably a better team than Colorado state. Um, so they do have a little bit of time to kind of rework those things, but also when you overlook an opponent like Colorado state, that sometimes is when bad things happen. So you don't really want to necessarily overlook this game. Well, and I think it's important to note that, um, you know, after I'm trying to go through and look at the game report to see, you know, after that turnover on downs, you know, Kent State really did not drive the ball 
very far after that. Um, oh yeah. I mean the defense that was really, really a turning point. I'm trying to remember if that was the series in which um let's see turnover on downs. If that was another one of those series where there was a big play by Keyshawn Abram. Yes. Oh gosh. Um, no, maybe not. This was a just a gradual drive, but they did. Yeah. Hmm. No. Okay. So there were a couple of big plays that Iowa gave up, right? Which Iowa's defense does not give up a lot of big plays on offense. Um, no, it seemed really uncharacteristic as I was watching that. Like, and it wow, was just too Iowa secondary that I'm used to seeing. And it was uh, Riley Moss kind of got, he was describing it after the game too. And he was saying, yeah, I got burned on these, pa- these two passing plays to Keyshawn Abram. Uh, basically, you know, he was caught in that, that situation where he's like, do I push forward and go to try to catch the pass or do I go backwards and try to cover? And in both times he was kind of defaulting back to, you know, I'm going to go for this pass rather than going back and covering. And he said he got burned. They, they totally read his mind. Um, and so, you know, he, uh, so he did get burned on those two plays, but then he ended up with the fumble recovery, you know, forced by Justin Jacobs and Jack Campbell. So, and then, you know, the rest of the second half, you know, ter- we did get to see some of Terry Roberts play for Riley Moss. And then Moss, you know, did a good job of, you know, having that short-term memory and, uh, you know, covering. So I think that those are going to happen. And I think that's what Riley was saying. He's like, you know what? Sometimes those big plays happen and, you know, everybody's got to make those big plays. You know, it's just, it's just par for the course. And just by pure statistics, it's going to happen. So, um, you know, that was part of the reason why, and I broke it down in my game story this weekend, or not just game story. My follow-up was, yeah, it looked in the, after the first half, like Kent state had the more explosive offense because it did look that way because you had two 40 plus yard passes by that quarterback. And so he's averaging like 20 yards per pass where Petrus is averaging seven you know, <laughs> so it looks Quite different. It's an offensive style thing. And, uh, you know, which one is going to be more accurate is the short passes. So, you know, it is all on the play calling at this point. Um, John, I'm, I'm curious what stood out to you about that Kent state game. Well, I thought, I mean, Kent state showed some things that kind of went well. And I think that it really could have been a much closer game had things gone a little differently. I think that, you know, you're looking at continued special teams um, performances that have been impressive to think that um, I think is Ivory Kelly Martin, who was diving for that punt where it was probably about this close while saying this close doesn't really help for our audio only listeners, but for our video listeners, this close from downing, 10 state within the one. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the defense didn't have its greatest game um, at times where they've kind of did get bailed out a few times um, by the turnovers by Kent state, not having an effective kicker, but they did the, I mean, they got the job done. They only allowed seven points and now it's been how many games in a row that they haven't given up, 25 or more points. I think it's 24 or 25 now. Um, so uh, we will bring that. We have that. We have that up <laughs> right here somewhere. Iowa has played 25 straight games without surrendering 25 points. The longest streak in the nation among power five teams. So there you go. The results kind of worked out pretty well for Iowa. I think that maybe you can't be super confident and say, hey, this was a signature win here. Look at how great we were when it wasn't a perfect game. But, you know, it's also kind of Kent State. This is a big deal for them going to Iowa. And Iowa, it's one of yet another game, one of another, I mean, handful of, well, it's actually probably the smallest of, any game on this schedule aside from Colorado state. So I think there's some of that Iowa coming off two really difficult games against Indiana and Iowa state. Uh, May I think that probably 
can't really be forgotten either. And you're, you're playing a lot of younger players. Uh, the defensive line and the offensive line really rotated their personnel more than ever um, mm -hmm. in, in these two, in this game. And then you gotta, you gotta say like Kent state and Colorado state, they have nothing to lose by playing these games. So they're going to be a exactly. little bit more ballsy. They're going to yeah. throw those 60 yard bombs. They're going to, you know, really give it their all and be like, because play like there's no tomorrow, because I mean, <laughs> to be quite frank, these are their bigger games and um, oh, yeah. these are their tougher games. I will say the defense did have um, something that stood out to me. They did have a high of seven sacks. Um, which is pretty well spread out. Lucas Van Ness had two. Joe Evans had two. Neither of those guys are starters. Um, no. But I looked this up, and um, Iowa's defense had a high of seven sacks, which is the most since they played Northwestern in 2000. So that's been a while. That's a really that's a quite a staggering. I know it's against Kent, against Kent State, but you think about all the other non-conference opponents that Iowa's played over the years. That's a pretty long time to go without seven sacks. And so I think that's something that's pretty stellar and says a lot about this developing defensive line that everybody was so worried about. And Kirk Ferentz did say today, he's like, yeah, you know, eventually we want to get a little bit more consistent, but I do, he does like to have like six or seven guys that can equally go in and stay the same and keep the same pace of play, keep the same, uh, intensity. And I thought, that was pretty, that's a pretty stellar statistic that I found. Um, yeah. So, and then yeah. offensively, Iowa has scored at least 25 points in nine straight games. So I know we all like kind of, I make fun of the big 10 for being very <laughs> low scoring, but Iowa surprisingly, whether defensively or offensively, don't forget, they do have, you know, in total offense, they are ranked last in the big 10 still, but you know, statistics can be deceiving. And hmm. Iowa has scored at least 25 points in the past nine straight games. So that's pretty good too, especially for big 10. I'm just saying and you look at it too. I think it's maybe Spencer Petrus has been getting a little bit of criticism because of, as we were mentioning with that earlier question, he hasn't had those big I mean Aaron Rodgers like throws um, not to remind Leah of my superior NFL team um, that I follow. Um, see, I'm getting all of the um, all of the shots taken at your schools and NFL fan. That's weaknesses. fine. I know I deserve it. I know people are going to give me flack for moving to the SEC. Uh, <laughs> Mark Morehouse, I think, was a Packers fan, so. This is not quite as much a, of a culture shock and people hate Cowboys fans. So, I mean, I guess they're probably like good riddance. This Leah Van girl is leaving town. I'm so <laughs> sick of her. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I was going to say before I got maybe a little sidetracked there, giving you a hard time about your Cowboys is it's been a while since Petrus has thrown an interception. If I'm looking at this last interception was November 27th against Nebraska on Black Friday. So it's been a while. And, you know, if you would have said at the Nebraska game, hey, Petrus is not going to throw another interception in the rest of this season. And the first, let's say we're about almost a month into the next season. I think people would be pretty happy with that. Yeah. And I think there was, um, Petrus has brought this up a lot saying that if they don't turn the ball over, they have like a 98% chance of winning. I uh, love these probabilities. I know. I also would like him to cite his sources or like, let's bring out <laughs> the analytics guy for Iowa and see if he can verify all these percentages that Petrus is throwing at us. Um, <laughs> but yeah. And I think, you know, I think I liked what I saw to Gavin Williams. Uh, I thought that was, really cool that we got to see. I know it's, I mean, it probably sucked for Hawkeye fans to see uh, Ivory Kelly Martin fumble twice. And I, I think Ivory is like, he's such a great interview. And I think he was really incredibly brave of him today to face the media and address his fumble uh, problems, which he has had three so far this season through three games. He's coming off an injury. He knows he's under the microscope as, you know, kind of that second back in. And, um, I thought it was incredibly brave of him to face the media today. 
Um, but what we saw out of Gavin Williams was encouraging, I thought. And I, I don't know if he'll play a little bit more on this game too. Well, going back to the Ivory Kelly Martin point, if I had three really bad screw-ups in articles, I it wouldn't be exactly a fun time to then get a peppered with a bunch of questions about it. Um, so credit to him there. That's, that's not an easy thing. Um, I think that speaks to his character and the reason why he is, he was voted a captain last week was that's the kind of leader that Ivory Kelly Martin is for this team. So, you know, whether it's on the field or off, like he is kind of an, he is an intricate piece of this offense. Yeah. And he didn't shy away from those questions either. So, um, to the point about um, Gavin Williams coming in there, I think that's a great chance here for Iowa fans to get to see something different. Um, I mean, I'd be surprised if there's any movement on the depth chart there, but it's nice to see what could be maybe coming down the road at a later point. Absolutely. And I think another thing that was notable is Petrus did tar- have several different targets um, in the passing game. We saw the first reception by Arlen Bruce. We saw Jackson Ritter, who's a name we don't see very often. Keegan Johnson was in on a couple plays. Tyrone Tracy had a bigger game. I'm interested to see if Tyrone will get the ball more this game. We're talking to him tomorrow. Um, Yeah, I think that was something that was also notable on this offensive game is that you're not just throwing to Sam Laporta, who is the top receiver as, you know, the tight end, obviously, at Iowa. But you are seeing Petrus target some other guys on that field. And I'm interested to see if he's going to pass the ball around more again against Colorado state. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. It could be, I mean, you mentioned Laporta. It could be kind of a battle between two tight ends that are used kind of in a lot of different ways. So um, that could be an interesting mashup this Saturday. Well, as interesting as a, I mean, upper tier big 10 team against a lower tier mountain West team can get. Um, so there are very few big 10 teams that are, that are left that are undefeated. Um, we got a list here, especially, I think Iowa might be, I should have had this note pulled up (laughs) ready to go. And I did not. Oh, maybe I just pulled this Penn state still Penn state. Um, Let's see how much we can remember off the top of our heads here. Purdue lost, so they were the other Big Ten. Okay, here we go. Uh, Wait. Yeah, so Iowa is the only team in the West. And then in the East, you actually have still a handful of them. Um, Maryland, which will make for an interesting matchup next Friday. Um, I will be in College Park for that. Um, you've got 20th ranked Michigan state. Um, you've got sixth ranked Penn state. So got some interesting matchups between Maryland and Penn state to lead off the big 10 year for, well, lead off the non week one big 10 year, uh, kind of easy to forget about that Indiana game. And then you've got Michigan and Rutgers who are also undefeated. So usually you don't really hear about Rutgers being three and zero to start the big 10 season, but crazier things have happened. I will say Rutgers. I just pulled it up. Has played temple Syracuse and Delaware, and they play oh. Michigan this, this weekend. No, they play Michigan. Yeah. This weekend. Yeah. I'm guessing three, you know, won't last. Um, just, uh, hot takes. Michigan yeah. is number 19. So <laughs> yeah, just a guess there. So I think that East crowd could get whittled down a little bit, but it is interesting about um, Iowa being the only undefeated left in the West. And the only team that hasn't played a big 10 game yet is Purdue. And everyone else has lost at least one conference game. So right now Iowa's solely King of the Hill in the big 10 West standings, obviously a long, long way to go ahead this season. Yeah. But I think I've seen some big 10 network commentators getting really high on Iowa. So 
you're going to have quite the, quite the season ahead of you, John. I'm a little bit jealous, uh, <laughs> even though I am moving back home and, uh, yeah, I think that you should wrap it up for our listeners here. Yeah. So, um, thank you to our, I guess, previous host now, Leah Van. Um, so on behalf of Leah, on behalf of our producer, Nathan Ford, um, thank you for listening to the Hawk Off the Press podcast. We will be back Saturday for after the final score. Um, so this will not be your final time hearing from Leah, but until and then next week, it will be all me leading the podcast. So until Saturday, thank you again for listening. And we will hear, well, you will hear from us again in a few days. <laughs>